Well, welcome to this talk on the cilia and the lining of the respiratory tract and what is called the mucociliary clearance system. Quite an amazing system. Now, inside your lungs at the moment, it is essentially sterile. And that is nothing short of an amazing statement because we're breathing in all these bacteria. Yet when you get down to the lung tissue at the level of the respiratory airways and the alveoli, the medium there is essentially sterile. And there's two reasons for this in immunity. There's innate immunity and there's acquired immunity. And the cilia and this mucociliary clearance system form part of the innate immune system. That means it's not specific to any particular organism, but it will clear anything out of the lungs. Viruses, bacteria, smoke particles, bits of dust, things that have been inhaled. It will keep the lungs clear and it will keep the lungs sterile. And the reason for this is we have what we call a respiratory mucosa. Now the respiratory part means it lines the respiratory system, so it's lining the nose, it's lining the trachea, the bronchioles, the main airways, all the way down to the very small airways, aligned with this specific type of respiratory mucosa. And the mucosa means it produces mucus. So a mucus membrane is a membrane which has mucus. The epithelium is lined with mucus. And the great thing about mucus is it's sticky. <laughs> so, so things that are inhaled will stick to it. So if something is inhaled there, it sticks to the mucus there, it will stick to it. But you don't want it to stay there because if it stays there, it's going to be static. And of course, we know that stasis always leads to infection. That's pretty well always true. Stasis leads to infection. Wherever you have stasis, infection is probably going to follow on, whether it's the bowel, whether it's the bladder, whether it's the gallbladder, whether it's the urinary system, you're going to get infection if you get stasis. So we don't want that, so we need to get it up. And that's where this mucociliary clearance system comes in. So first of all, it sticks to the mucus, but then we need to get it up. And we have these cilia. Now these cilia are, are nano machines. You hear a lot of talk, talk about nanotechnology. The cilia are amazing nano machines. They have a nine plus two arrangement of microfilaments, nine, round the out, nine pairs around the outside, two in the middle of these microfilaments. And these microfilaments will slide and bend in an amazing way that I certainly don't pretend to understand. But what it means is that they, that they will move like this. They'll move. So what they have, if they, they have an, an effective stroke and they have a recovery stroke. It's a bit like an oar really. So they'll go like that and that'll waft the mucus in that direction. And then they'll kind of go back. That's the recovery stroke. And then they'll waft again. So the end result is we get this raft of mucus on top of the cilia, which is being wafted in a particular direction. Quite amazing, really. <clears throat> and any one ciliated cell in the respiratory epithelium can have 200 of these cilia sticking up from the surface. And typically in the respiratory tract, they're about seven micrometers in length. That's about the same as the diameter of a red blood cell. And they're about one micrometer in diameter. So absolutely microscopic. Nano machines with this internal sliding, moving filament system inside it that provides the motility. And it takes quite a lot of energy, actually. The cells in the respiratory mucosa, which are ciliated, are packed with mitochondria to produce the energy. Remember, the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell to produce the energy for this wafting movement to move the mucus up to where we want to get rid of it, the mucociliary clearance system. And, and that brings us on to another quite remarkable point, really. Um, the cilia in the nose and up here waft mucus down towards the oropharynx, the tube that connects the back of the nose and the mouth and the larynx. So that they kind of waft down towards the oropharynx. And the cilia below that level, that they waft up towards the oropharynx. And not only that, the cilia in this lung waft in this direction. And the cilia in this lung waft in this direction. So you've got this direction, this direction, this direction, all moving towards the oropharynx. So I can <coughs> just done it then, just cleared my throat. What I've done is I, I moved the mucus. Actually, what I did then, there was mucus in my trachea and I moved it through my larynx to my oropharynx. And in my oropharynx, when it arrives in my oropharynx, I had a choice. Uh, in this case, I chose to swallow it. 
In other circumstances, we might choose to spit it out. <laughs> but the point, the point is, if it's at your oropharynx, you've got a choice. So it goes down there to your oropharynx. Just think of your cilia and when your nose were wafting the other way. <laughs> We'd have runny noses all the time and you'd be dribbling onto your notes. It's, 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 it's brilliant the way it's designed. That They go down, they go up, they go up and they go up. Or to get to the oropharynx, quite, quite amazing really. So this mucociliary clearance system with the sticky mucus. Now, these cilia are, are present at birth. We, we know this. Um, they're present at birth and they're functional for probably three days and fully functional by nine days after birth. So this is really quite an early life, early life change after the in utero uh, environment. Now, after birth, uh, when, when a baby's born, the, the bronchial passages are essentially there. Um, they, they grow what's called geometrically there's a geometric growth so it's not that you're sprouting new bronchial passages in the first few months of life you're not there already there from fetal life but they grow in size this geometric growth but what does greatly increase in the first two years of life are the number of alveoli so a lot of the lung growth is increasing the size of the airways which are already present this geometric growth but we develop many more alveoli and there's very good evidence that suggests that exposure to pollution in early life uh, from the time of birth up to two years can have uh, grave developmental, adverse developmental effects on the lungs resulting in long-term lung disease. So important that babies have a non-polluted environment. And uh, e even a few years ago in this country, I used to see parents in a car smoking with children in the back, absolutely infuriating and outrageous. Thankfully, most people in this country now know about this, but in developing countries, it's still tragically a major problem, especially where uh, people are obliged to have fires in the house, wood fires or dung fires, and uh, the smoke there means that the children's lungs get a really bad start, which, of course, is really quite tragic. Now, if you want to know how effective cilia are, um, it, it's hard to know unless you look at what happens when they're not there. So I treat lots of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who have fibrotic changes and inflammatory changes in their bronchial passages and their cilia don't work and they're, they're coughing pretty well all the time. In fact, that's what chronic bronchitis is. It's a chronic cough over several years and they're chronically coughing and they're producing infected and green stagnant mucus. Well, you might have come across a condition called cystic fibrosis where the mucus is too thick Cystic fibrosis is mucoviscidosis. The secretions are too thick. And because they're too thick, they won't clear properly. So we need to help these children clear their lungs with a lot of physiotherapy. And they have chronic infected problems. And of course, smoking, cigarette smoking, tobacco smoke will reduce the motility of the cilia as well. So if someone's smoking all day, then their cilia are basically paralysed uh, all day. But then they go to bed and they uh, don't smoke overnight, hopefully, and the cilia start working and they waft the mucus up. So, so the mucus that should have been wafted up the day before is only wafted up overnight, explaining why smokers often have a, a lot of uh, coughing in the morning, the, 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 mo the morning cough. And it's important to remember that the cilia work best in uh, warm conditions, so it needs to be 37 degrees centigrade. And they also work best in moist conditions. So part of the reason when you get cold, that you get a cold, that you get a viral rhinitis, might be that the motility of the cilia are reduced by the cold air. And this innate mucociliary clearance system doesn't work for a period of time, allowing the establishment of a viral infection. So they work best at 37 degrees centigrade and they also work best at 100% humidity, which we often forget as healthcare providers to humidify and to warm the oxygen. So to keep the cilia working properly, we need humidified uh, oxygen.